I also would like to thank the organization, the ISTH, uh, for the honor to speak science at this festive uh, evening. And, well, I hope not to annoy you too much with science. So, we'll speak about 100 years of heparin, the past, the present, and the future. And if I can speak about it at all, that is because of a number of uh, co-workers that worked with me over the years and that see you enumerated here. And according to the cool dog maxim, if you are to talk to people, first tell them what you are going to tell them, then tell it them, and then tell, tell them what you have told them. So here is uh, what I will be going to say. I'll tell about the past and give a short history of the discovery, the chemistry, and the clinical use. Then I'll talk about present current practice, and then about what I think is the future of the practice. And the present current practice will not go undamaged, I must say. Well, then the history. This is Jay McLean that is uh, supposed uh, to have discovered heparin a hundred years ago. And I must say that uh, celebrating the discovery of heparin in 2016 is like celebrating Christmas. You're celebrating an historical fact, but all historians agree that you're not celebrating at the right moment. Because Whatever J. McLean has done, he has not discovered heparin. He found a lipid material with anticoagulant properties from liver, heart, or if you read about the stench of his preparations, it might as well have been of bacterial origin. In fact, his boss continued this research a few years later and again found a lipid material with anticoagulant properties and he called it heparin, but it was not heparin. The real heparin is a water-soluble material with anticoagulant properties that requires a plasma cofactor. And that was found around 1922, 1925. And in fact, something like that was found many years earlier by a French group. Et ça veut dire pour les francophones entre vous qu'il faut toujours publier en anglais. Now, if we look at the discovery timeline, the research on real heparin was done by Howell, shown here in red, in years after. 1916, and J. McLean only worked in the first years after 1915. And the material that they studied was, phos phos was a phosphatide uh, in the beginning, and uh, what we called uh, heparin only much later. But the name heparin appeared before the substance heparin. So the real discovery of heparin, the birth of heparin as we know it now, is around 1925. So, well, when it's like celebrating Christmas, there should be Christmas presents and surprises. And the first surprise I have for you is that McLean did not discover heparin, neither in 1916 nor later. Then, about the chemistry of heparin. In 1928, Howell said it was a carbohydrate with sulfur. In 1934, it was a highly sulfated glucuronic acid and glucosamine. And in 1937, Jorpus thought it was the glucuronic acid plus hexosamine with five sulfurs per two, per two suckers. Then came a real breakthrough in our understanding of heparin in 1976, when the three laboratories, Rosenberg's lab, Lindahl's lab, and Barrowcliffe's lab, almost uh, simultaneously found 
that only one in three of hep the heparin molecules binds to antithrombin. And in the years later, Lindahl and Kasu determined the structure of the ATC binding site, because if only one out of three binds to antithrombin, then there must be a specific site that is responsible for that binding. And the structure of that site was found by Lindahl and Kasu and their co-workers. And then in 1983, Maurice Petit II was able to synthesize that specific pentasaccharide. And here you see Maurice Petit II, and in the background is one of the pioneers that has been instrumental in developing the ID of low molecular weight heparin, Jean Chouet. And then there is one more and very essential discovery made a few years later, and that is when David Lane showed that for the antithrombin action of heparin, 12 ordinary sugar residues without specific structure are required to one side of the pentasaccharide. And this is something you should keep, keep in mind because it will return time and again during my lecture. So now let's have a look at unfractionated heparin. They are tremendously large sequences of saccharides, and every now and then you have that specific pentasaccharide that's shown in orange. And in order to be an antithrombin, and not only an anti-10A, in order to be an antithrombin, it needs those 12 units in blue to one side. And how does such a molecule help in activating thrombin? Well, very simple, antithrombin binds to the antithrombin binding site, and thrombin adsorbs somewhere else on the same molecule, and then by linear diffusion slides to the antithrombin, and then both bind irreversibly and leave the heparin molecule. Factor 10A does exactly the same thing, except for one important difference, and that is that it can also be inactivated by antithrombin without having a slide. So it can directly interact with antithrombin that is bound to pentasaccharide, and which thrombin cannot. And you should recall that, or you should know, that factor 10A is uh, inactivated three times less efficiently than thrombin is. And that fact that tends to be overlooked when activities are expressed in units relative to a standard because then the handicap of 10A is called a, a unit, like the thrombin is called a unit. Now what about the development as a drug? In Howell's material, what he made in, uh, in Baltimore was less than 5% pure and extremely toxic and the dogs didn't survive. Then Best, Charles and Scott made something that was much more pure, and some dogs survived, but it was not really something you could try in a human. And the first thing, uh, the first material that could be injected in humans, in humans uh, was the material made by Europus in, uh, in Stockholm. And uh, one of the humans that were injected no, intramuscularly where with this material was Birger Blombeck, that you may remember, a very important researcher in our field, and he couldn't sit for three days. And then from 1937 on, Organon Roche in the Netherlands made more than 90% pure heparin, and that was used. In 1939, it was allowed as a drug in the USA. By 1950, it was a well-established anticoagulant. And then came, again, a very important discovery, or 
Yeah, and that was that Vijay Kakar showed that a low dose of heparin, unfractionated heparin, three times daily, gave a 75% reduction of pulmonary embolism at the expense of uh, very little bleeding. And then in the years 1985 to 1995, there were a lot of trials and other work that introduced low molecular weight heparins. And that brings us to the subject of low molecular weight heparins. The birth of low molecular weight heparins was in 1976 when Johnson and co-workers in London uh, made uh, heparin preparations with a low molecular weight and show that the anti-10A potentiating effect uh, was high. And here you see the abstract, you're not supposed to, uh, to read it, but what you see is that plasma heparin levels were measured using the anti-10A assay. And that article was not only the birth of a low molecular weight heparin, it was also the birth of the focus on anti-10A activity. But now what happens if we chop up a heparin? So we break a connection here and there in the molecule, so we get a lot of small molecular weight heparins, and sometimes during this chopping up, you uh, destroy the slide that is necessary for, uh, for thrombin action. So there are some that retain their activity against thrombin and 10A, and there are others with only 10A activity left. So at the same amount of antithrombin binding sites, you have the same anti-10A activity, but less slides for thrombin, so less antithrombin activity. So, surprise two, the fractionation of a heparin bereaves it of much of its antithrombin activity rather than increasing its antifactor 10A activity. Nonetheless, anti-10A is seen as the principal antithrombotic activity of low molecular weight heparins. And from 1976 until the present time, it is believed that anti-10A activity represents anti-thrombotic potency. You see, from 1976 to Wikipedia in 2016, this is believed to be true. And it is logical that people thought this way, because in those times, uh, the clothing cascade was the the normal way of thinking about the mechanism of coagulation, and there is a very important article of Jan Wessler and Stoll in which they say that these data indicate that the efficiency of activated factor 10A inhibitor is an anticoagulant during normal blood coagulation, an action profoundly enhanced by heparin, may depend more on its preventing any generated activated factor 10A from activating prothrombin than it may on preventing thrombin from attacking fibrinogen. Mind that thrombin is also always the key enzyme, but the question is whether there is less thrombin made or whether the thrombin that is made is inhibited. Or in other words, as Yin himself used to say, it is much more efficient to close the tap than to mop the floor. And that was in terms of the cascade hypothesis as it prevailed in those times, was a completely logical thought. But is it true? Now let's have, make a very simple model of thrombin formation. Prothrombin by the action of prothrombinase becomes thrombin, and thrombin by the action of antithrombin becomes inactivated. Does heparin inhibit the conversion of prothrombin into thrombin? That is the question. So we look again at this model, and we make an, an, another model, an, an analogous model. And thrombin, 
the, the conversion of prothrombin by prothrombinase is like pouring water in a container with an, that is open at the end. The action of antithrombin and heparin is the thrombin, that, the water that leaks away, and the action of prothrombinase is the water that is poured into the container. It's also a model of your bank account. Because if this is your income, and these are your expenses, uh, then, and this is your capital, then the in or decrease of capital is income minus expenses. And now, a uh, physiological system is much more clever than most humans are. It doesn't expense, expend more than a percentage of the, of the capital. So the income is the change of capital plus a percentage of the capital. Similarly, prothrombin conversion, the velocity with which prothrombin is converted into thrombin, is the change of thrombin concentration plus a percentage of the thrombin concentration. This simple idea we developed already in 1986, but it was purely accessible subsampling technique and nobody noticed. Nowadays, it can be done much easier with the thrombin genera automated thrombin generation methods that we have and with the aid of better computers. And if we do that, we can answer the key question. Does heparin indeed inhibit prothrombin conversion? Does the anti-10A action play a role. And here you see what you do if you do a normal thrombin generation curve, plus and minus heparin. And then when you calculate prothrombin conversion, there is hardly any difference. So the answer is that heparin does not inhibit prothrombin conversion to any appreciable extent, and neither unfractionated nor low molecular weight heparins do except when the anti-10A activity gets sky high, as for instance in Fondoparinux. So, prothrombinase is hardly inhibited, and prothrombinase is 10A plus 5A on phospholipid, so apparently the amount of 10A is not important. 10A does obviously not set the pace of prothrombinase, but factor 5A does. And today, this is not surprising any, anymore, because all of you, you know that if factor V is mutated to factor V Leiden, that makes a thrombotic tendency, that makes too much thrombin. So today, it's no surprise anymore, but in those days, it was. So, conclusion. Heparin, either unfractionated or low molecular weight heparin, until you get to the very, very, very low molecular weight heparins, acts at uh, there where it's indicated. So, surprise three, molecules with only anti-factor 10A activity are irrelevant for the antithrombotic action of heparins, unless they outnumber the antithrombin molecules by more than a factor of 10. And I think that you will know what in the English language is a red herring, apart from a fish. It's also something that distracts the attention from the real issue. And if ever there was a red herring, it was anti-10A activity. And this is a proof. We plot the concentration of pentasaccharide containing molecules with or without the 12 molecule slide uh, to the left. And we look at the inhibition of thrombin formation, and we see that the pure pentasaccharide, without the slide, you need 10 to 100 times more to inhibit uh, a thrombin generation than you need from unfractionated heparin. And if you do this with a low molecular heparin, you get something that is perfectly parallel to the unfractionated heparin, but it's shifted along the x-axis because of the number of irrelevant 10A only molecules that you add. And here you see another proof. In this experiment, 
we made a very large number of very na narrow molecular weight fractions of heparin, either from a low molecular weight heparin that are the open circles, or from unfractionated heparin, the closed circles, and we gave exactly the same concentration of pentasaccharide containing molecules, and we looked at the inhibition of thrombin formation, and you see that the very low ones in which there is the pentasaccharide, but not the slight necessary to inactivate thrombin, have hardly an inhibitory action. So it appears better to close the tap than to mop the floor, but to every difficult problem, there is a simple intuitive solution that is neat, plausible, but wrong. And the anti-factor 10A action made the whole scientific society bark up the wrong tree. But then, if it's not the anti-10A action, then what makes low molecular weight heparin so clinically useful? Now, we took four preparations, an ultra-low molecular weight heparin, a low molecular weight heparin, a middle molecular weight heparin, and unfractionated heparin, and here you see the molecular weight distribution. And we injected 9,000 anti-10A units on the label to 12 healthy volunteers and took samples at nine time points between half an hour after the action and 10 hours after the action. And in this way, we got 432 samples that contained heparin. And we calculated the bioavailability. That is, how much inhibition do I get for my anti-thrombin units? And then it appears that even though the anti-thrombin in the low molecular weight heparins is somewhat lower, much more, it is much more effective. So it's the bioavailability, among others, due to the longer half-life time that makes the big difference uh, uh, between, anti, uh, between unfractionated heparin and low molecular weight heparin. And also, there are less accessory binding sites, so less non-anticoagulant actions. That's one of the reasons that the, one of the reason that unfractionated heparin has such a short half-life time is that it binds to about everything. We end the larger the heparin, the more of all types of interesting chemical things are there and that make that that heparin can interact with something else. So the larger the possibility of sites capable of non-anticoagulant interaction and uninspected actions. Well, one is, the, of course, as you know, all is the binding to platelet factor 4 that causes heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. And we reasoned uh, also that the hemorrhagic ac action of unfractionated heparin is rather due not uh, to the other saccharides, but there are more of these things. It's anticytotoxic heparin can reduce myocardial reperfusion injury, and now I'm talking about the non-anticoagulant actions of heparin. It's anti-asthmatic, it's anti-ulcerative colitis, it's anti-tumor uh, actions have been described, anti-metastatic ac actions, and anti-arthritic. And the non-anticoagulant actions of heparin, I think, uh, I uh, promise a lot of surprises in the future, but of course for that we need first to obtain preparations of non-anticoagulant heparin. Now we come back to this graph where we put the length of the heparin molecule against it, the capacity to inhibit thrombin formation, and the inhibitory power increases in the lower molecular weight range and slowly decreases somewhat. But the bioavailability decreases very much with a higher molecular weight. And the other positive or negative effects also increase with higher molecular weight. So 
what are the low molecular weight heparins? The low molecular weight heparins are those heparin molecules that are in the comfort zone of the best compromise between bioavailability, inhibitory power, and accessory effects. And here you see that unfractionated heparin is not in that zone. Uh, a good low molecular weight heparin is, and a very low molecular weight heparin still has a lot of these properties. So, surprise number four, low molecular weight heparins are so useful because they are a good compromise between inhibitory power, bioavailability, and a low tendency to negative side effect. So, surprise five, obviously, if you measure anti-factor 10A activity, you measure a label that sticks to effective and ineffective molecules alike. So, how to measure the anticoagulant effect of heparins then? Well, the common solution is don't measure it at all, just give a standard dose. But can we use the APTT for this, uh, this purpose? Again, we take our 432 samples, and we find an anti-10A activity that is significantly high in 98% of them. That's to be expected, of course. But the APGT is prolonged only in 34%, and without any difference between unfractionated heparin and low molecular weight heparins. So obviously, the APGT is not useful. Poor surprise, APTT stands for a poor technical tool. It's not suitable for measuring the effect of any heparin. And then, of course, I, I looked at my pet. Here, that, here you see my, my cat. He's called Hanky. And I called this method of calibrated automated thrombinography after, after him. And notably, the area under the curve, as you know by now, is a very useful parameter to look at anticoagulant action. And again, we take these same samples. APTT significantly prolonged in 34%. Thrombin potential significantly decreased in 83%. Well, then you may say, anti-10A activity is again much better because that's uh, significant in 98%. Yes, but don't forget that the pharmacological effect is measured in the APTT and some of potential, and that this only measures molecules that have the pentasaccharide and that are often ir irrelevant. And if you want to number the molecules, how do you, should you do that? Well, obviously, by anti 2A activity rather than my anti-10A activity. So, surprise number seven. Until present, no adequate methods have been used for determining the effect of either low molecular weight heparin concentrations or its effect. And as long as the heparin effect could not be tested, there is no ground for the community's opinion that it needs not be to be tested. And what do we see if we do measure the pharmacological effect? Well, here you see the thrombin generating potency in the general population. It's almost constant in a single person, but it varies enormously in the population. Actually, it varies as much as weight does. And because you have very skinny and very fat persons, you have people that, that from their nature, make a little amount of thrombin and those that make an enormous amount of thrombin. And this does make a difference because in a very important uh, research done in Leiden, it has been shown that if you separate the normal population in four quartiles, then those that make the highest amount of, uh, of thrombin have a relative risk that is four times higher as the mean, and those that make the lowest amount of thrombin have only half that risk. That means that within the normal population, there are, is one quarter of the population that has a seven times higher risk to get uh, thrombosis, uh, venous thrombosis, than the lowest quartile. 
So there are no standard patients, but maybe then there's still a standard response to heparin. So what we did then was we took 40 individual plasmas and had the same fixed amount of heparin to each, and we looked what the effect on thrombin generation was of that fixed amount of heparin. And we found this. So obviously, there are people with plasma that under-responds to heparin, and people with plasma that over-responds to heparin. And not only heparin, unfractionated or low molecular weight heparin, but also Fondoparinux and the novel anticoagulants, be they anti-2A or anti-10A, they all show a very large variation in the individual response, anticoagulant response of an individual plasma, expressed as the variation of co coefficient, of course. And here you see the same thing again. Now in normals and uh, patients with unfractionated heparin, low molecular weight heparin, and pentasaccharides, and you see <coughs> that the variation coefficients of the inhibition you obtain with a fixed amount of the material around IC50 is absolutely enormous, which makes, because this adds upon the natural variation that uh, these patients and these normals have in making their own thrombin. So if you look at what the result is of giving that on the thrombin generation potential, you find enormous variations. And this confirms that there are individuals with a plasma in which heparin has hardly an effect, as well as such that over-respond to heparin. So, should a high responder with low thrombin generation get the same dose as a low responder with high thrombin generation, and the high responder will risk to bleed, and the low responder will remain at risk? So standard dosage is perfect for standard patients, and for all others, standard doses come in two kinds, too big or too small. So what you should do, in my opinion, in the future, <coughs> is that you say, A, is the thrombin forming capacity of this patient high, average, or low? And then, is his response to the anticoagulant that I'm going to give him, be it heparin, be it, be it a DOAC or whatever, high, average, or low, then you should adapt your dose to this situation. You only have to do it once because in one patient it's more or less standard. Well, not many becomes ill, but that's another question. So, surprise eight. Differences between people are more important than differences between drugs. Or, one may give a standard dose, but there is not such a thing as a standard response. So the future, in summary, according to me, is you should use thrombin generation for measuring the effect in patients. You should give personalized doses. And if you want to measure the concentration of active heparin, you should use anti-thrombin activity. And the main surprises were that McLean did not discover heparin, neither in 1960 nor later. The anti-factor 10A activity of a heparin does not account for its antithrombotic action until it is sky high as in Fondoparinux. The APTT is a poor technical toil. Low molecular weight heparins are so good because they are a compromise between anticoagulant power and bioavailability and good anticoagulant medication required personal dosage. But, I'm sorry to say, people are usually more comfortable with old error than with new solutions. Thank you. <laughs>